We'd like to acknowledge that the videos that we're taking are made on unceded and unsurrendered Algonquin territory. We'd like to thank the Algonquin Nation for hosting us on this land. I'm David and I'm here out at Mech Skimming again to continue our explorations of the winter world. I'm so glad you guys could join us today. We are once again excited about the questions that you've sent us and I've been noticing that a lot of you refer to the, the trail cam videos that we've put out there. Those animals seem to really capture your interest. And this week we're going to focus on animals. We'll be using a lot of the trail cam videos throughout this, this film. And we're gonna look at the, the animals that are out and active now, try to figure out what they're doing and just how we can know what their daily life is like through the, the signs of their activity. Um, I'm sure that you've been out and exploring your neighborhoods and you've probably seen some of these signs already. I think the most common one that people mention are the tracks of the animals, those footprints that they leave behind every time they move around. And this time of year is perfect for learning about what's going on in the animal world because it's really hard to go out in the snow like this and not leave a trace that you were just there. So. Today our focus is going to be on tracking those animals in your neighborhood, figuring out who's there first of all, uh, what is it that they're doing, what's their behavior, and starting to learn about how to predict where they might be. Because often when students are out at the centers, they always want to see animals. If you can learn to become better at seeing animals and you can learn to predict where and when they'll be present, and then you can go out on your own and, and discover these things. Now, there are two terms I want to start with right now, and that's a track and a trail. A track is every time you step down your foot or put a hand in the snow, you leave a track. But it's that line of tracks after you walk from one place to another that is a trail. And this is really what is gonna help us distinguish whether or not an animal made it or it just happened because maybe there was snow on a tree that fell off. And you can see on the ground beside me here, there are marks in the snow, not every mark in the snow is a track. Because we want you to be able to go out into your neighborhoods and find the animals near you, we're going to take them in groupings of animals based on the tracks that they leave behind on their behaviors and what's most commonly found in an urban setting here in Ottawa. So some of you may have pets at home. We're going to start with pets and their related wild neighbors. So please stick with us. You can skip around the sections if you want to find a particular grouping of animals to check out, but let's take a look at some animals that I'm sure you can find no matter where you live in the city. Almost forgot to add one more thing this time. We're going to do things a little bit differently. Um, there are sections in the video where you can pause it and make sure that you have pencil and paper on hand. So we're going to be working in our journals or wherever it is that you've been recording your observations and your findings. Uh, so having these things on hand will take some time to sketch each of the tracks as we go and by the end we'll have a nice field guide that we can take out into our neighborhood as we're searching for tracks as part of our next challenge. I'd like to introduce you to the tracks of the Canada family. Not Canada Day, Canada Day. These are our coyotes, our red fox, and our domestic dogs. Now, they all differ just slightly. Sometimes it's size and a little bit of shape, or if you can see the claws and how defined they are. The domestic dog is the one that you're going to notice around your neighborhoods most often. If you go for a walk in your neighborhood, chances are you're going to see some prints in the snow. The domestic dog print is often more square shaped than the red fox or the coyote tracks. Chances are, unless you live close to a forested area, you will most likely be seeing dog prints in your neighborhood. When you're watching a coyote or a red fox as they move, you'll often notice that they walk in a straight line and they're back paws tend to fall in the same spot that their front paws were, which creates that, that straight line kind of look. Even though they have four legs and four paws, it looks as if they've only been walking uh, with two feet, one in front of the other. 
take a look at this footage and see if you can really notice how that back paw or back foot lands in the same spot as the front foot did. If you watch very carefully, you can notice that the back foot almost kicks the front foot right out of the way as the coyote walks past. Do you see those glowing eyes? We're going to slow this one down as it comes in. You'll be able to take a look and really notice how the back foot tracks in the same spot as the front foot does. Now watch this little cub coyote. See the green dots? That's where to focus to notice how that back foot lands where the front foot does. Pretty cool, hey? And now just one more. As we watch this coyote walking away from us, you can again almost see how they land in that straight line as they're walking away. Now that we've taken a look at the coyotes, let's take a look at another member of the canine family. This is one you might recognize by its fur color. I'm talking about the red fox. The red fox moves very similarly to the coyote, but it typically has smaller paws than the coyotes, which is one way that we can differentiate the paw prints between the red fox and the coyotes. Take a look at these following clips and see if you can notice how the back paws track into the same spots as the front paws do as they move. Here we have a couple of red fox exploring an area at night. Notice they're definitely searching for something as they move about the field. This little guy seems to have a bit of a prance and is definitely on a mission. This red fox definitely seems to have caught a scent of something. Back and forth, constantly sniffing the ground. I wonder what it's looking for. Notice that the red fox moves with purpose. Do you think you know what that purpose is? Food, you're right. Do you remember that word last time, subnivian? Remember it means below the snow? What might a red fox be looking for below the snow? Little creatures like mice and shrews and voles tunnel in those subnivian layers that we talked about before. Well, those make a delicious meal for our red fox. Watch as this one stalks very slowly and then bounces on its food. Our coyotes and red fox are typically prey driven or food driven, you might say, especially in the winter time because they really need to find the food in order to survive. Most often, you'll notice that they are moving in that straight line or aren't wandering all over the place because they have a specific focus or a specific reason for being in the areas that they are in. Domestic dogs tend to have not as much purpose when they move. They'll sniff on this side of the sidewalk and then across the other side, weaving back and forth and have their tracks that are a lot more erratic or all over the place. My dogs often cross right in front of my path and I almost trip over them. They're crazy. Here's Tundra. I've taken the dogs out for an afternoon stroll and they've decided to wrestle around and play in the snow. My two aren't babies anymore, but they love playing together and wrestling. Domestic dogs, just like wild animals, tend to be pack creatures and they do often live and play well together. 
Lindsay and I took our three dogs out for a walk together to try to get some footage for you to see how they move and the different tracks that they make depending on their size and speed and since it's winter, how much snow's around. No matter how long a dog's Hi. legs are, when there's enough snow, they still need to bound through and jump out of the snow banks. Watch as the dogs run. They tend to have their front paws and their back paws moving at the same time. There we go as they pick up speed. The two bigger dogs move similarly to our wild dogs. You'll notice that when they're running, their tracks land one in front of the other in the tracks, creating that straighter line. Sometimes when they're running or galloping, they leave a bit of a C pattern. Look at this little track guide from our coyote. Do you see that little curved pattern? That's what happens when they really are running with purpose. Notice here how the track style changes between the dogs. One is more of a bounding, two feet landing at a time, where the black dog tends to have more of that walking pattern. Take a look at this one as we see Kakuli, the little guy, bounding through the snow. He's got short legs, so tends to plow through the snow as he goes. You'll notice that even with our bounding dogs, the back paws are landing in the same spot as the front paws do. Now that you've seen the differences between our coyote, our red fox, and our domestic dog, I want you to join me in sketching a picture of a paw print. Do you have your paper and pencil ready? All right. To start our sketch, I want you to draw a large oval. At the top of the oval, you're going to add four more ovals, two larger ones in the top center and two smaller ones on the sides. At the bottom center, you're going to draw what looks like an upside down heart. These are now the five pads of your paw print. Grabbing a darker shade, maybe a black or a brown, you can start to shade in all of those little pads. Notice on the actual coyote, it kind of looks like a black or a brown shade. They tend to be a bit darker. Don't forget to add your four little claw marks because all wild animals are going to be leaving that claw mark indentation in the snow or in the mud. Continue to shade in all the pads of your paw print. You'll notice there's a bit of a space between the four paw prints, the two in the top and the two in the bottom, so that you can almost draw an X in between them. Cat paw prints don't allow you to do this. There's not enough space. You've now drawn your paw print in the direction of travel. That's what that arrow represents. Thanks so much for learning about our dogs, coyotes, and red fox. I'd like to introduce you to another family of tracks, and those are the tracks of the cat family, or the Philidae family. Now, you are much more likely to find cat tracks in your neighborhood and in your yard than we are here at McSkimming, and that's because at McSkimming and the Bill Mason Center, we don't really have any wild cats that live in this area. So, why don't I take you to my house to meet my cat, Chico? and we'll examine what his footprints look like. Now I'm warning you, he does not like winter very much. So I might have to work pretty hard to get him outside to make tracks in the snow for you. Here comes Chico. Let's take a look at how he's moving. You might notice that the back and front legs of opposite sides of his body move at the same time. How many toes are visible inside this track? In the cat track, you'll also notice that there are no claws. Now let's take a look at the trail that Chico leaves as he walks.
Cats are part of a family of animals that are called diagonal walkers. And so we'll see in the cat track as he walks, there's always kind of that diagonal curve. Sometimes his back foot even lands right in the same spot as his front foot was. So it looks like the two tracks are, are overlapping. Now that we've had a chance to look at my cat outside and you've seen some footage of him walking in the snow, you might notice that his paw is a, looks a little bit like a canine paw, only it's different because when you look at a cat print in the snow, you don't see the nails because cats are able to retract their nails so they can bring their nails back inside and a dog can't. Now, cats have those long nails because they're predators, so they use them for helping to catch their prey. A cat does most of its hunting at night. So if you can remember that word that we talked about before, nocturnal, cats are nocturnal. So they, they are nocturnal predators. And when we look at predators, predators have their eyes right on the front of their head so that they can zone in on, on their prey. So when you look at your cat or cats in your neighborhood, you'll notice that their eyes are facing front and they're not on the side of their head like animals that might be prey. If you're out in your neighborhood looking for tracks of cats, the tracks that you find are most likely going to be the tracks of the domestic cat like this guy. Most wild cats are unlikely to be found in urban environments. The two wild cats that live in Ontario, the bobcat and the lynx, prefer solitude and they are nocturnal hunters. So we're not likely to see them during the day. The lynx, which are found in, in more northern Ontario climates, have feet that are specially adapted to winter. And if you joined us for our winter adaptations video last week, you learned all about different ways that animals adapt to winter. The lynx has large feet that are very hairy and have hair in between the toes and pads of their feet, which allow them to stay up on the snow. It's kind of like they're wearing snowshoes. They like to eat the snowshoe hair. That's their main diet. And so when the population of snowshoe hair fluctuates, the population of lynx fluctuates as well. Now let's add this track to your observations. So if you've been making observations in a journal or on some paper, let's get that out. And we're going to practice drawing the cat track. We're gonna start with a circle. In that circle, we're going to want to draw four toes, two at the top and two at the side. Notice that the one of the top pads is slightly further ahead than the other. Then for the heel pad, we're going to draw what looks like some overlapping mountains. So three bumps at the bottom and then two at the top. Once you've done that, you can start to take a darker color and color in those toe pads. Notice that there are no claws in this one because the cat is able to pull their claws back in. The group of animal tracks that I want to talk about today belongs to the hoppers, generally what we call them, and they tend to leave a track that has four parts to it. It has all feet registering, so their hind feet and their front feet are all present in each of the tracks, and as they hop, they make a new track, a certain distance away from where they started. And I'm going to start with the smallest of those, so work our way up from the mice in this area, through the squirrels, and then finally end with the snowshoe hare. So join me as 
we head into the forest and start to look for the tracks of the hoppers. I am in the forest and I'm following the tracks of uh, a rodent that lives in here, probably a deer mouse or a white-footed mouse. And they leave such a delicate footprint, they can walk right on top of this light, fluffy snow. Remember, they're one of the hoppers, so they tend to leave a track that has their two hind feet in front. Let's see if I can do this. It's not as flexible as you all. Their, their hind feet are in front of their front feet. So they hop, but they have a tail that leaves a nice line most of the time in soft snow like this. So it really gives away their tracks. We follow along, you can see the size compared to my hand. There's that tail drag and the two prints. So that's hopping, hopping, hopping as it goes along there. And we could follow this for quite a while. You can see the snow actually provides them with an, an easy passage over the surface until they can get back down into that subnivian world again. Let's see if we can find an entrance where this mouse might have gone. These mice tracks may lead to a burrow or an underground food cache that they have down there. Um, and we're more likely to see mice tracks above the surface like this. They'll dive back down in the hole, but the shrews and the voles that live down in those subnivian runways don't tend to come up quite as often. We don't capture a lot of footage of mice on the trail cams. In fact, it, it's very rare that we see them. But here's a short clip I want to share with you that shows them hopping around. And if we couldn't see their eye shine in there, we probably wouldn't notice them at all. You can see the eye shine. Look at how it's just constantly hopping around. Such erratic movement across the field here. This latest trail of tracks that I've been following isn't the most clear but I know that it's a squirrel. And I want to share a picture that Emily sent in when she was out doing some tracking that she took and shared with us. So thanks again, Emily. Here's a really good picture of red squirrel tracks. Now I'm going to follow these tracks right up to a place where I can see that they've been feeding recently. So follow me. I have followed the trail of another hopper here in underneath this fallen tree. And I can see there are a lot of tracks leading in here. They're a bit bigger than the, the mouse. And there's just so much material here, little bits of scale left over from pine cones that this creature has been eating as, as its winter food. Now, I know that it has underground dens and probably a series of tunnels underneath here where there's food stored and places that it can escape predators and, and just stay to stay warm. Again, this creature, the, the red squirrel, is one of our most common hoppers here in this forest. And this is a sure sign that, that they are active here in the winter. We've just seen the evidence firsthand of what the red squirrels leave behind as they've been feeding and going about their daily activities here in the forest. Now let's take a look at some of the trail cam footage that we've captured of red squirrels. Like the mice that we saw, these red squirrels are constantly in motion, kind of quick jerky motions as they roam around in search of food and often defending their territory. Here you can hear the chattering in this next mix as they jump around and communicate to one another. This red squirrel is feeding in the top of a sumac tree, so it's gathering the seeds from the sumac and enjoying a break in the sun there, hopefully free from predators. Although we tend to see more red squirrels out here at Mexkimming, um, I'm guessing that you're more likely to see the gray squirrel. and It can be black or gray in color in the city when you're looking around. Um, so just remember this very similar track. They have a bit different habitat. You'll find them in the forest, the deciduous forest, where they're bare of leaves and in neighborhoods much more often, unless there are conifers nearby. As you're searching around in your neighborhood, remember that the tracks of the gray squirrel will just be slightly larger than those of the red squirrel, but similar kind of a hopping pattern through the snow. We're, we're out here at the Bill Mason Center and come across some excellent examples of snowshoe hare tracks. This is one of our hoppers, and the pattern that you find with them is the, the two hind feet 
line up when they land and the two front feet uh, are often hit the ground first and they're usually offset with our, our terrestrial animals, the animals that travel and live on the ground. They're usually at a bit of a diagonal like this. So if I were hopping over this, now I'm not a rabbit or a hare, the, but if I were hopping, I would land so that my hands hit the snow like this, so, and my, whoa, I wouldn't sink though if I had snowshoe hands, and my hind feet would come behind like this and get ready for the next leap into the distance. Now, if you come in closer though, let's take a look and try to find that pattern made by the snowshoe hares. Here you can see where the two front feet have come in. They've come in close together and formed this depression, and the two large hind feet are beyond that. And if we look around in this area, we actually see the snowshoe hare was sort of walking here, was moving around slowly, it was probably nibbling, just seeing what it could feed on here. And it, then if we come over to here, we can see it does more of a hop. So we go from, from this one and hopping to here. Now, <clears throat> they have the ability to, to hop even a greater distance, two or three times that distance, if they really put their muscle into it and are moving along at a quick pace. I'm gonna follow these tracks for a bit and let's see if we can find some more signs that the snowshoe hare tend to leave behind. Here we can see the snowshoe hare feeding in the summer. And watch when it moves those, those strong hind legs, those large hind feet. In the fall, we begin to see that transition from the brown to a, a white coat as those hairs change. And again, you can see the, those long legs, those big back feet of the snowshoe hare. That's what leaves those tracks that we see behind. And the speed is incredible. In fact, uh, we can't see much. It's like a blur coming at us right here. So let's slow things down. This is about a quarter of the speed again. Look at that power and you can see how those tracks are formed by that snowshoe hare. I followed the snowshoe hare tracks and they led me here to this this kind of opening in the forest that's filled with these shrubby evergreens, these junipers. You can see they have some berries on and clear signs of feeding. When the snowshoe hares are, are feeding on this material, we refer to that as browsing, and we can tell the difference between snowshoe hare and other animals in the forest here uh, by the signs that they leave behind, the way that the end of the twig is cut. If we look very closely at this, we can see it's like a 45 degree angle, a nice sharp line right there at the end of the twig. <laughs> now, after feeding on all this woody browse, their scat, their poop, or their pellets, are basically little balls of, of wood chips there. And you can see closely here what they look like. Again, not to be confused with the deer. So two very different animals that leave very similar signs behind them in the environment. As I started to follow those tracks of the snowshoe hare, I thought that it's not as likely that you'll come across a snowshoe hare if you're in Ottawa, in the city, than you would come across another animal. I have a picture of, here's my daughter, and this is right downtown. You can see just beside a building, and maybe you don't notice what she's looking at right yet, but if I zoom in, can you see it now? What if we get a little closer? Now you can see it. And that is the rabbit that you're most likely to find in the city, the eastern cottontail. Now its feet, its hind feet are much smaller than those of the snowshoe hare, but it still has that same track pattern where the two front feet fall and then the, the hind feet behind them in the pattern, so that, that four track set. And then there's one more thing. If you see a rabbit, but you don't find those scat, uh, but it's brown like this and it's winter, then that's a pretty good a clue that it is an eastern cottontail. Their coat does not change white like that of the snowshoe hare. That's the last of our hoppers. So if you just think size, if you always ask yourself how big was the animal that made those tracks, then you should be able to connect the animal with its tracks. If it's those tiny little tracks that belong to the mice, those bigger tracks that belong to one of the squirrels, or the large tracks of the snowshoe hare, that will help you to sort that group out. 
Now join me as we work on drawing the track patterns that can be used with all of these hoppers. We're going to start backwards with the hoppers. For the snowshoe hair, I like to draw a triangle first and then put the two large hind feet up in the top there and then the two front feet down in the bottom on a diagonal. You can fill in the toes. I know they have four toes on each of their feet. And then I'll go back in and kind of color it in and fill in the outline of their, the hind tracks there. And remember, you can pause this at any point if you need to give yourself some more time to do it. So the hind feet are done. Now we'll do the front feet, kind of fill them in. And there we have it. You can see that, that diagonal that they're on. This arrow shows the direction of travel. If we want to change to the red squirrel, we'll take those front tracks away. We'll put in two others that are parallel to each other. It's a straight line across. And now we have the red squirrel. We can switch that into a deer mouse by just adding the tail. Remember, it's not the same size as the deer mouse, so we're going to shrink it down to make it appropriate. And there you have your most common hoppers. If you've been following along through the whole video, then you might have a journal or a page that, that looks similar to mine. And what I would like to do now, and this is your challenge for the week, is to go outside in your neighborhood again and see, bring this with you of course, because you're going to make some observations and recordings of your own, bring this as a reference sheet. Go out and see just how many different animal tracks you can find in your neighborhood. So again, your challenge is to get out in your neighborhood, get to know it even better, get to know your neighbors. And I'll see you next time. We'll continue tracking next week. We're going to go into those animal species that you're likely to find if you start to get out of the city into more forested area or into some of our larger parks. I always appreciate your questions and your comments. If you have some good photographs, then please send them. And I'm actually going to leave you with a little bit of a mystery because Abby is another student who has been sharing many of her photographs with us. She's been doing some amazing tracking out there. And one of the creatures that we're going to look more closely at next week is the creature that made this track that she sent us. So take a look at that. If you think you know what it is, you can send in your guests too or keep it until next time. Until next time, be well and have fun out there exploring.